Welcome everyone to the Fireside Chat, Lean, Intelligent and Sustainable Mobility for a Better Tomorrow. This Fireside Chat is part of the AI for Net Zero track of the 2021 AI for Climate Global Forum. It is a pleasure to be here with you. I would like to welcome our special guest this time, Dr. Maya Bandor, Lead of Sustainable Automotive and Mobility Work at the World Economic Forum, and Aldo Perez, Senior, for, uh, Senior Product Operations Manager at Cruz. They will tell us more about how to use AI systems to power smart transportation and mobility systems. Going a little bit more in depth, I would like to talk to you more about our special experts. Dr. Ben Dor has been devoted over a decade to sustainable mobility from public, private, and third sector settings working in three continents. At the World Economic Forum, Maya leads sustainable automotive and mobility work, including the Global New Mobility Coalition, the Scaling Automotive Fleet and Infrastructure Finance, the Circular Cars Initiative, Moving India and Emerging Markets, and Last Mile Ecosystem. Dr. Maya, holds a PhD in dynamic transportation policy and technology transition and a master in environmental change and management from the University of Oxford. Now, to go with our second expert and interviewer of this conversation, Aldo Perez Varela has 14 years of experience working in the US, Germany, and Latin America. Currently a product manager at Cruise, he is deploying the world's first driverless and fully electric ride hailing fleet. A certified climate reality speaker, Mr. Perez previously led Uber's shared ride strategy in Latin America. An economics undergrad, he specialized in public policy. Dr. Bendor, Aldo, thank you for joining us. The microphone is all yours. Thank you very much, Lucia, and thank you very much, Dr. Bendor, Maya. It's a pleasure to be here. And well, with those introductions, I feel uh, there's not a lot of space necessarily for, for further intros, but uh, I would think that the audience might appreciate some, some initial context of, of who we are and why we're here, no? So first of all, thank you very much for, for the space. I'm super excited to, to talk today about, about AI, about uh, reducing emissions and, and especially getting to action, right? Like getting to policy solutions that can actually make a difference in this world. Uh, so to, to get ourselves started and, and continuing a little bit uh, of the segue into those intros, Dr. Vendor, or Maya, as you asked me to, to call you earlier. Uh, Maya, uh, I would like, uh, maybe you can walk us through your, your recent work and what you're doing in the global uh, coalition, the, the sustainable autonomy, sustainable automotive and mobility work you're doing, um, and, and what are the, the exciting projects that you're currently working in. Thank you so much, Aldo and Lucia, for, for having me. Um, and for that wonderful introduction. I'll get to your question. Um, I work at the World Economic Forum, which is um, the international platform for public-private collaboration and uh, for improving the state of the world on sustainable mobility and automotive. And we did a portfolio of project that was described by Lucia Pryor. We're looking at life cycle emissions on the one hand, we're deep diving into in-use of mobility, options, mobility services. We're looking at the automotive industry that is transitioning and transforming and we're trying to create a dialogue between these market leaders and the decision makers on the public front, both regional, uh, state, and local, to ensure that we are together propelling that vision for new mobility ecosystem we are jointly aligned around, and to make sure that we are syncing our actions, public and private, in order to get there sooner than later. Uh, thank you, Maya, very much for, for that context. And now that we're getting now more, more into the topic, uh, before we get to AI, I would like us to put, to get into the context of what do we mean by net zero for mobility, no? Uh, you were talking about life cycle management. I think that's a critical element that not many people think about. It's not only our car when it's on the streets, but what happens before and after all of that life cycle. Um, so could you tell us like more or less what's what's the current state of the world? How far are we from reaching a place where our entire mobility industry is actually getting closer to that net zero? Um, where do we think we're headed? I think we, we've made a big, we, we've overcome a big hurdle, which is change of mindsets. I think we're already there in terms of mindsets. And we've seen that in the EIA mobility conference just uh, earlier this fall. And we've seen the unveiling of some circular car visions and so on. 
But I think critical is the underlying understanding that emissions from life cycle vehicles will increase from just 20% from the sourcing, manufacturing, and afterlife today into 60% for these pieces of the life cycle of automotive by 2040 as we transition to electric vehicles. With that in mind, as we shift to zero emission tailpipe solutions, we also need to make sure that we are now sourcing more wisely, we're manufacturing more wisely, and that we are dealing with the afterlife of these new products uh, more sustainably and accountably. And I believe that we are largely there. Now, just to give one example, steel, for example, steel, one of the three pillar um, emission generator industries, um, is actually driven by automotive. Automotive accounts for 13% of demand for steel. Um, and therefore, if we tackle together with steelmakers and automakers that problem of shifting to net zero steel, we'll actually double win this game, uh, both from steel emissions, but also from um, the demand for manufacturing of vehicles. So just one example. Uh, and, and that's it. I think we're getting into a very interesting point because what, what can be more important in the near term? Like uh, taking care of the emissions of that entire process or switching the fleet's um, combustion engine to, to electric vehicles, right? There are massive consequences, I think, mm -hmm. for, for having this transformation from, from ICEs or internal combustion engines and to AVs. I think the chemical aspect to it is often overlooked, like how it will transform mining to have such a dramatic increase in demand for batteries. So what could you tell to our audience, Maya, about like what are, what are people overlooking when they think about this transition? from electric vehicles, uh, sorry, from ICEs to electric vehicles? I think, I think there are many, many niche areas that we can act on. And I think that there are some more mainstream because there are large industries and they, the connectivity between automotive and these industries is quite obvious and there is willingness to act on both sides. And we'll see some announcement coming in a couple of weeks from Transport Day November 10th um, and earlier on even uh, from COP, and I know that some of us have been working, and thank you so much for representing a company that has been also very active in this space. We'll see some news come out. But maybe I want to piggyback on what you said earlier, and that's on the in-use phase. Currently, in-use phase of vehicles accounts for 80% of emissions from the whole life cycle of vehicles. Most certainly, we have to tackle that piece. The transition to fleets altogether presents an opportunity to reduce emissions more quickly than otherwise. And we are racing against the clock, looking at a peak emissions at 2030 for this sector. And we already are seeing a lot of action and willingness on both states and cities and manufacturers and fleet owners. So I'm pretty confident we can get there, but there are a few more nuances or a few more tweakings and alignments that need to happen for that to be um, a smooth sail, uh, starting with manufacturing the right amount of vehicles or enough vehicles at the right cost quickly enough. Um, I think we'll get there, uh, but, but we still need to align a bit and prioritize. And I'm very grateful for the leaders like who's, um, that has been leading the chart there. Um, I want to add that electrification alone will not get us there fast enough. By 2050, we will have 2.5 billion cars in the world. Now we can cut this number to 0 0.5 billion if we combine shared electric and autonomous mobility solutions. And that's a critical path forward. And, uh, and then we're getting onto a more interesting part, right? Like shared vehicles. And I think we can start also discussing AI in that context. Um, I used to work for, for a ride hailing company, right? And we had a shared product. And uh, when I used to work there, we had a problem, which is like people won't choose the shared product, even when it was heavily subsidized. Just share half of your trip and get more than half of a discount in your fare. And people wouldn't take it. There are challenges to just people's way of, of life and, and way of using transportation. So how much do you think we'll need to adapt there? Like how can policy affect people's choices in the end? Uh, so when, when price is not even everything that matters here, like what are the policy opportunities in, in increasing our shared uh, transportation? Um, there are spectrum of opportunities for policy action there to try and unlock our behaviors 
from single occupancy vehicles and into a variety of opportunities that serve the needs for mobility best, uh, particularly as each and every one of us have different ways by which we move about or would like to move about uh, along our lifespan. Uh, being young, being a family member, being an elderly, we have different opportunities or needs in terms of how we move and also how we move things and demand for deliveries is going to increase dramatically by over 70% just over the coming eight years. And therefore, you know, the policymakers have the opportunity to rethink the allocation of public space and the determination of mobility costs in a way that will slowly but truly shift the needle, but they're not alone there. We also need companies that bring, bring to light the right set of products at the right time and market them the right way. And we also need third parties and we need community leaders yeah. to try and encourage people to get out of their comfort zone and lock in and step yeah. into a shared ride or on-demand transit or yeah. into a two-wheeler or a three-wheeler or walk and use you know a variety of modes for one single trip instead of a, a door-to-door trip. Uh, to yeah. enjoy community life, to enjoy the street. Yes, uh, I'm also hoping towards a future like that, Maya. Um, I think that the dream is, just as you put it earlier, shared, integrated, electrified, automated. Uh, I don't know if you actually said integrated, right? But for me, you know, um, that's where technology can start to bring some some real advantages. If If it's, as you said, like companies have a part in this, probably the private industry has a part in this. If you create a product that people actually want to use, you know, where, where sharing is easy, not only cheap, but it's easy, like it's quiet uh, and dependable, then I think the transition is easier, right? Uh, I envision, you know, a, a 2030, 2040, where, where people don't need to drive. They don't have emissions as they are moving around the city. And also one where even when they're not using the vehicle, we have a circular economy, right? Where we're reusing all those those materials and all of that. We're, we're already getting into policy uh, aspects to it. I think I want to come back to that item. Um, but, but I think now we can also touch on AI itself. And I think also getting into the actual topic of, of, of today's questions. Um, AI could have a role in this shared space. That's where I most obviously think of it from my experience where, where I've been working in, right? Right hailing AI, where does AI fit in here easily? Like deploying the vehicles, where should they go? But also AI drives the cars in this future. What are other spaces where AI might help us bring about, uh, you know, a more green mobility environment in the future? I think that the two points you made are quite a lot. Um, I think that, you know, we, we, we all recognize that as the, as we transition or as we adopt AI in different fields, uh, we're increasing efficiencies and we are decreasing safety hazards. And that's certainly the case for uh, for road safety. So road safety has taken the lives of many, has damaged the lives of many. Um, and then we can actually improve on that front. We also can decrease the cost of mobility. I mean, think about car ownership now being around $9,000 per year on average, and that number has increased by 5% just from last year. Um, And then you can actually slash down every ride's cost by 70% if you shift to um, an autonomous ride. That, That presents an equity opportunity too. So we can actually provide for a better mobility option for most of us not just the few of us that can afford the upfront cost and the maintenance of, of car ownership. Uh, and that would be that would be a great benefit. Uh, we obviously can also, if we couple, you know, we talked about AI and then electrification, if we couple the two, we obviously can slash emissions and reduce congestion. That's all together. But I want to also note that there are there is different developmental stage in different places around the world. Um, And it's very hard, you know, for us to have this conversation coming from very specific angle um, into mobility transitions, talking about a car ownership lock-in, whereas in some parts of the world, actually, the majority of of people don't have an efficient way to move about. They don't even dream about owning a car, but they might soon if we don't change that dream with them. Um, And that's where we we need to put a lot of energy. So the role of government in different places will be quite different. But what is evident is that some places it is easier to leapfrog because 
they can just keep that unsustainable lock in that we find ourselves in. And to give you a good number, I think, is that the congestion has been increasing by 20 to 30 percent um, over the past decade, and it will continue to increase as we have more, you know, more demand. Now, to wrap up and touch upon the applica applicability of AI in mobility, besides the operational angle and the route planning that you talked about, um, I think that AI can increase the ability to serve for the elderly, for disadvantaged people, um, as, as they can have more easy access to affordable uh, services that accommodate for their needs best. And that is up to us to design for this. It's not, a, it's not a given either. Uh, both street design, infrastructure design that fits that need and also in-cabin design that fits that need. And, and how do you envision that AI involvement? Like, how, What could AI help us do differently that would increase access to, to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to transportation? So I guess in, in a few ways. First and foremost, um, this is the ability to pay for a service that is tailored to your needs. Well, currently, um, it, it's not affordable. In some places in the world, we have actual mobility deserts, like in Japan, where elderly populations around, you know, scattered outside of cities, um, have not really been able to justify the operations of transit, for example, um, or other mobility service providers. And now with AI, given that you have the opportunity to slash that cost of every mile driven, because simply because you're more efficient in the way you operate, then you're able to serve for that need. So it's both the route planning, right, the on-demand aspect of it, but also the cost of using that car. So that goes even before cars are driverless, right? Which would further probably decrease the cost, but definitely this, this could be something more, more in the near term. All right. That, th thanks for that context, Maya. Um, super. So I would like to get to, to a separate part of the conversation or, or a slightly different angle here. Um, I want to discuss a little bit your thoughts on, on urban design, right? And then how also cities and how they are organized influence how people have to move, right? You mentioned that uh, as long as we don't change the dream, uh, then people will continue to dream of having a big house very far from a city center and then like having to transport themselves probably 20, 30 kilometers uh, every single day. Uh, but at the same time, we're having this decentralization of work where people can work remotely. Of course, it's still a very small minority, but the trend is that that increases. So how do you see um, the future in that regard? Like, how should we build, how should we be building cities for a more sustainable mobility model? Well, I think that's a million dollar question. How? Um, I think the reason alignment around the vision, but how do we get there is still a question. I think there are quite a few platforms um, that combine the knowledge of cities across, around the world, but also across regions that have similar contexts and trying to generate the best knowledge out there. Um, for example, NECTO or, or Police Network. And these are a great examples of how there is an interest and there is um, a collaboration between different decision makers on the urban front. And that gives me um, um, a lot of good vibes around what can happen in the urban context. Now, um, with the pandemic, we've seen that uh, policymakers have been bolder. They've been able to take some plans that perhaps they had in their drawers and implement and try out um, without worrying about their political, uh, the political implications of that, simply because they were responding to a crisis that happens to also demonstrate to everyone that there are ample opportunities out there to use the space more wisely. And to give you some numbers, um, one study says that 90% of public space in cities could actually be freed up if we just plan for efficient needs. Now, if we look at road space and the way we divide it, then let's say that a protected two-way bike lane can move um, over 7,000 people uh, per hour, and the dedicated transit lane can move 10,000 people per hour. A sidewalk can move 9,000 people per hour, of course, depending if they can walk and how fast. But in comparison, um, car lanes that are not prioritized and that are not um, planned for more wisely can move only 1,600 people. So obviously we can design for efficiency. It's not easy to get there. And that space versus cost balance that I talked about before that is at the disposal of city's power uh, can, can go a long way. Yes, for sure. I think that's a, 
the sign is a political choice. I, I heard someone once say, and and I couldn't agree more. Uh, hopefully, we get to cities that are designed for people and, and not designed for cars. I am a personal fan of that myself. Um, and well, uh, where where do we go from here? Uh, I'm thinking of between all of these topics that we've touched on. No, like we're already touching on some policy potential actions, and that's in the end where I think I, I ultimately would like to carry the conversation. Um, in, in, from, from all of these points that we've touched on, is there a particularly urgent call that you would make to policymakers as to how to how to improve life in cities and transportation? What's the, what's the headline there? First, um, work with your community. Know what your people want and then plan for that. Everything is up for debate. Nothing should be taken for granted, particularly as we look at land use and understand land use and mobility have then have a huge impact on how people feel about their cities, how people generate um, joy, generate income, generate growth, and, and connect with each other in cities. That would be my headline. I would also say that it's not just up for cities, um, and I'm glad to see cities experience with zero emission areas, for example, that has been quite successful. There are various ways to do that, um, and it's a transition. It's not a um, you know, and, and one a one silver bullet solution for entire cities, but rather incremental um, learning curve around different areas in the city that is to learn to these specific city use cases. Uh, but I also want to point out that regional um, regional players like California have once again done it. Um, I don't know if you want to tell us a bit more about the SB 500, but I think that's a pretty intense um, announcement. Uh, so, uh, the, the announcement we had on the driverless permit? What, was that the question? Yeah, on the... California... So California mm -hmm. has announced mm -hmm. that, that it will require every autonomous vehicle to be electric um, soon enough. I believe that was by 2026. Um, sorry, 2030. 2030, so, yes. so California announced that by 2030, every autonomous vehicle that will be um, authorized to operate would have to be um, electric or zero emissions. And that's a bold, important move forward. And I want to say that I owned, um, when I still lived in the U.S., I owned your car, the cruiser's car. I, I owned an EV. Oh, amazing. And it's a great experience. Yes. And actually, if I might continue with the free publicity here, we, we took it a step further. And the fleet is not only 100% electric, but also all the electricity uh, generated to power these vehicles is also uh, renewable. So it comes from electric and wind farms. So that's that's definitely a step in the right direction, but um, it's not the entire um, story, right? We, we Our first topic was precisely life cycle management. And I think that's also a space where, where industries can uh, be bold and, and lead others in being responsible for the, for, for the materials themselves when the user is, is done, right? Um, and probably that's a good segue into another space of, of conversation, I, um, which is the, the the change of owning a car versus just using mobility as a service, just consuming it mile per mile. Um, I sometimes believe this might be a double-edged sword, right? If autonomous vehicles are truly, you know, effective of, at, at what we're designing them to, to be, which is a very scalable and cheaper mode of transportation, uh, then probably the consequence is that cities expand further out because, you know, you might take your two hour commute, but, you know, you're not driving, you're not suffering that commute, so to, so to speak. So that might reduce the cost of, of long commutes and then entice people to, to have that. But at the same time, we have the opportunity to, to have the right policies and, you know, bring cities to be designed not for cars, but for people. Uh, so have you have you had any uh, conversations along those lines with with policymakers? Like, uh, what what are the potential dangers of not applying these new technologies in the right way? Yes, certainly. I think that I'm I'm, I'm very glad to see a lot of policymakers thinking long and hard on um, 
fourth industrial revolution technologies and how to implement them in a way that would benefit all. You know, in the context of, uh, of autonomous vehicles, there is that double-edged sword of, you know, we are providing a potentially more affordable mobility option. We can make it zero emission, which can require that it will be like California has done, um, and therefore we'll be better off um, because we're allowing people to drive the miles that they need and afford that. Um, but at the same time, we're compromising um, on our ability to control what will happen to how landscapes are shaping, how people's movement is shaping. Now, we cannot and shouldn't control everything. Some things are, you know, in evolution. You can't find, fight against that. But you can design wisely based on previous knowledge. And I'm personally of the opinion that people living in a condensed environment is more sustainable um, and therefore, the hope is that as we transition to autonomous vehicles, the idea is not to transition to a different type of operation of the vehicle itself, but rather altogether change to intermodal systems so that the autonomy that uh, comes within a vehicle will fill in these segments of journeys that they fill in best. Uh, for each and every one of us. And it might take different shapes and forms depending on who we are and what stage in, in our lives we are in. And ideally, we all walk more. And ideally, the skies are blue and we all feel safe and, and we breathe good air in. Um, but we can't always do that. And we have to plan for that and, and leave space for choice too. I think that's also important. People need to make decisions. They just need to be well informed about the implications of which decision they make. Super, super good points. And I agree with you, Maya. I also like that vision. Well, we start to, to wrap up now. Uh, I will just field one, one last easy question, but I liked a lot of the uh, conclusions or near to policy recommendations that we got to. Um, I, I liked a lot your headline of get to know your community. I think there's no serial bullet and uh, there's no one single thing that is going to make this work for, for all of us. Uh, my, my last question for me, Maya, would be for, for you, any, any good case practice or any, uh, you know, anything that you would, any story you would like to share with us that leaves us hopeful for the future and that great things can be done? Have you, have you, uh, you know, found any example like that? Well, I look at my own household and, and we are a car-free family most of the time over the past decade and a half when I had a, a vehicle, it was electric. Um, and when I don't need to, I try not to have. And my children grew up playing with cars and then pretending that um, they are stopping to replace a battery because we had a swappable battery car when they were born uh, over 10 years ago. Um, and now, you know, when they look uh, around the street, when we walk through, they're looking at the different cars that they can have just within the click of a button on their mobile phones. And for them, most of the options, the scooters that they see, the bikes that they see, the transit, you know, everything is accessible to them. And I think that's a fantastic way to, to look at the options out there and I encourage us all to give the same opportunity for our children because that's how we actually change mindsets from day one. And then I also want to invite everyone to just engage in a dialogue. Um, if you're wearing a public sector hat, if you're wearing a private sector hat, if you're an NGO or if you're just a community leader, if you're just a person that is curious, Tune in, listen in, uh, have a conversation, and the forum is inviting everyone to engage with its communities, and we have a few communities tailored for these conversations, like the Global New Mobility Coalition that Cruz is a steering member of, and we also have the Cycle Cars Initiative, Road Mobility Transition and Finance, Last Mile Mobility. Um, we should all solve for these together because these are joint problems. Fantastic, Maya. Thank you very much. And I think that's a very inspiring and very true message. Uh, there's a lot of action we can take ourselves with our, with our decisions and role modeling that to the next generation as well is critical. Uh, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's been great uh, to get to know you, Maya, and to have this conversation. Thank you, Lucia and Regina, and, and back to you. Thank you both, Dr. Maya and Aldo. This has been a really, really interesting conversation. We are positive that we need more efforts like this, like the ones that you're both carrying out. Uh, both in the World Economic Forum and on cruise um, to just make the world better. And um, I think it was really enriching learning from both your experiences. Um, Dr. Maya, I think I agree with you 100% in what you said regarding that everyone has a part on what they can do to make sure that they're involved because this is a problem that is of everyone. 
right? Um, so thank you for, so much. I, I agree with Aldo that this was a very inspiring message to end the conversation with. And um, Aldo, thank you so much again for your experience as well. Uh, we know that you're doing a lot of things as well in your company to make sure that we have a more sustainable planet to live on. And um, Cruz is, a, is an amazing company as well. Um, so for those who are watching, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, during this uh, fireside chat. We will see you at the next um, session of the AI for Climate uh, Global Forum 2021 in the AI for Net Zero track. And um, stay tuned. Uh, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>